Welcome everyone. Good morning. Hello guys. Um, it's our pleasure to be here today for the second day of the webinar, uh, the Dense Energy Care and the Advanced Energy Storage Division uh, from CINI. So uh, today we have two special guests, two young uh, researcher professors that uh, are, have the, 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 the career rocketing up, very ascendant. So thank you guys for being here today. It's our pleasure to receive you guys. So today we're going to have about a 45, 50 minutes talk, and then we open for 10, 15 minutes questions. And um, please uh, ask your question in the, in the YouTube comments or on the Zoom. And then we will be more than happy to try to answer all this, okay? Um, first of all, we're going to start with Professor Alex Roberts from University of Co Coventry. Uh, I have the opportunity to, to meet Alex two times in Warwick University where uh, he's been working on uh, supercapacitor manufacturing. And uh, now he's associated professor in um, Coventry University, where he has been working with um, cylindrical cells, uh, manufacturing of supercapacitors and um, batteries. So uh, he has been working on uh, electrodal preparations, cell preparations. I know part of the guys here from the center are doing this kind of research. And uh, I guess you guys will be more than happy to learn. And there's a lot of people also here from abroad and for other parts that are interesting on the topic. So thank you very much guys for joining us today. Uh, I guess the best way to, to, to talk about Alex is letting him talk by himself. Alex, uh, the, the, the room is all yours. Thank you very much once again for attending us. Okay, thanks, Hudson, and thank you for the opportunity um, to present today. Really looking forward to it. Um, so what I'd like to talk to, uh, to you about today is cell prototyping um, and the journey from coin to pouch and cylindrical cells. So going from your initial lab discoveries going through to cell manufacture. So if we think about what do I mean by cell prototyping, and where does it fit um, in this journey? When you find a new material, a new discovery, you're typically working at the low technology readiness levels of one to three in the laboratory. And the majority of people I think who are working in the energy storage field or in the cells field at some point will have made some coin cells or swage lock cells on a smaller scale. As you go through, you may want to have a look at the properties of these in slightly more detail. And that's where the prototyping stage comes in and where I work. So here we're looking at going to the higher TRL levels up to from three to five or six. And now we're talking about making tens to hundreds of representative cells per week. Now by representative cells, I mean cells in standard commercial formats, such as your 18650 and 21700 um, cylindrical cells, and also your pouch cells or prismatic cells. As you go beyond this, um, you would hand over to a pilot facility um, where they take your, your work from the hundreds to the thousands or even tens of thousands of cells per week. I'd just like to say at this point here, there is no firm boundary between where prototyping stops and the pilot um, picks up. Beyond that, we have our gigafactories. They're popping up all over the world um, and are becoming famous for the largest, largest industrial buildings on the planet. And these are huge facilities. And I just put lots of cells per week because the numbers are changing all of the time, but we are talking millions and more cells per week. So if you think, why do we want to prototype and what are the benefits of making these cells? So you think through going through the prototyping stage, we get a better understanding of the materials and the components that go into um, a device and how they affect the final application properties. So the in-device properties. The key performance indicators um, that we use to assess our materials, our cells and our technology, vary depending on the scale and format of the device that you'll be looking in. So some of the things that you may measure in the early stage laboratory may not be as relevant by the time it gets to late stage application. And the prototypes are better for understanding the cell performance, as I say, at the final application. 
Other parts to look at this, um, they're an essential part of the optimization and the design verification process. Now to take a discovery through to full production is a very cost and labor intensive process. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're not investing all of this time and money um, in something that may, may not make it. So it helps you gain credibility and confidence in your discoveries and make sure that you're on the right path. On the credibility and confidence level, it also gives you added bonus when you go and speak and try and transfer your technology to possibly another, um, to, a, to an industrial partner. Uh, most people can put together a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm sure that a lot of these uh, industry people have seen too many of them. If you can come along with data that backs that up and prototypes, it's a lot more, so you've got a lot stronger case to gain the um, investment that you're looking for. And the last point is to pass the, to cross the technology readiness valley of death. So you may or may not have heard, heard of this before. What it refers to, if you think of the journey that a discovery takes, you get a lot of enthusiasm and investment in the low TRL levels. And then when you get to the mid sort of prototype stage, a lot of the time it's harder to get the push from the academic side or from the SME side or the pull from the larger industry to navigate to the higher um, TRL levels. And these prototypes can be very, very good instruments to get across um, those limitations. So if we think of, we've had our Eureka moment. Um, let's take an example. We've got a brand new material um, and we think it's gonna change the world. What's the first thing we need to do? So to start off, typically we'd look at understanding the structure and the properties and characterize the material um, as completely as we can. We then get to the point where we need to start assessing the electrochemistry. So if you're looking at a battery, for instance, you're looking at things such as your voltage profile, your capacity, your lifetime, the rate behavior, your um, first cycle efficiencies and um, irreversible, irreversible capacity losses and things such as that. And these are typically studied in a half cell in the laboratory and then followed up with a coin or swage lock full cell. So if we look at these, um, cell formats that are usually encountered, they have a number of advantages. They're easily accessible. Um, the investment required to set up a laboratory to be able to work with these is not that high considering the money that's out there in, in the field at the moment. They're absolutely essential, uh, essential for R&D, whereas I work predominantly in the prototyping and larger cell format, I still use swage lock and half cells and coin cells all of the time myself as well. Um, there is no substitute for a lot of what they can do. You have the advantage they only need a small amount of materials um, and they're excellent for the materials and assessment and for understanding the fundamental science. They do however have a number of drawbacks. So if you consider making a coin cell there's a very large excess of um, electrolyte that goes into there. Um, so if you have a process that's happening as you're cycling a cell for instance that's consuming electrolyte you're not going to see this effect. You're working with a half cell you have an inexhaustible supply of lithium there in the lithium metal disc you're putting in there. When you look at factors such as the power and power density of material, they don't give you a true power density or the true power behavior of your cell because it's more of a device property. There's no thermal information you'll get. Um, generally speaking, especially when you go to higher power applications, cells get hot when you cycle them. And this has a negative effect on properties such as lifetime and you can't get that information from a coin, swell, coin cell. Put together with this, they don't consider the non-active components that go into the cell, um, and hence they don't give you information on energy and power densities. So if we look at the complete cell components that go into a cell, you can see in the green the areas that we consider in our early stage research um, and in understanding material and coin cell level. So we have our cathode, our anode, and our electrolyte. Now, with our electrolytes, you may, you may be very careful about the amount of electrolyte um, that you put into the cells. Certainly, I know a lot of people will put an excess of electrolyte into the cell, um, in a coin cell, so you're not worried about this quantity. When it comes to our cathode and anode, generally speaking, we only really concern ourselves about the active material. So you've got all of these other parts that contribute weight, volume, um, and resistance in a lot of the places um, to the cell that aren't really looked at in this case. So what effect does this have? All of these need to be considered to get a true energy and power density. If we take some excellent work um, looking at these cell 
components and contribution of components, take an example of a NCA graphite 18650 cylindrical cell and break that down at the manufactured level, we can see there is still a significant amount of the cell mass and volume coming from the anode and cathode active materials, but we've got a large proportion that's coming from other, um, other components in there. So if we look at how this affects the results that we thought we had in the first time, you can break this down and they've done this in this work very nicely um, by looking at the uh, gravimetric and volumetric energy densities here. So in case number one, you've got your active materials theoretical capacities that you do purely from calculation. When you then consider the practicalities of, for instance, for example, maybe derating some of the electrodes to give a longer cycle life, you can see we have a drop in capacities, uh, sorry, a drop in the energy densities. If you then add in the mass and volume of electrolyte you're going to need in theory, and then in practice, we see another drop. You add the components of the jelly roll, such as the separator and the current collector, and we get a drop again. Then when you get to case number six, we put in all of the mass and volume of the can or pouch material or tabs and everything else that goes into there to get the numbers and values that our end user is, uh, is really looking for. And as you can see, these are significantly, better, significantly lower than what we thought from the initial work. Give you an example in supercapacitors. The Rigoni plot is um, used as a, as a fingerprint metric um, and a performance indicator for supercapacitors. It's simply a plot of power density versus energy density. And it's very, very common in the scientific literature when people are looking at a new material to calculate power and energy densities from um, constant current cycling in a full cell or even from cyclic voltammetry in a half cell. And then they'll calculate their energy density and their power density and scale these numbers up to a value in kilos um, and say, this is my power and energy density. Um, and it is so many times higher than the leading manufacturer. What they're missing out in there are two important factors. The first thing is that there are standards as to how you must measure your power density. Uh, sorry, your Rigoni plot. And that's through a, a constant power cycling rather than a constant current and also the manufacturers are including all of these other components. So how does this actually um, pan out in looking at experimental results? You can see here some pouch cells um, that I made in supercaps. They're, they're, they're not blowing the world away. They're standard EDLC supercapacitors. And what you can see is the number of electrode pairs that are in these. So making a larger cell, a higher capacity cell, capacitance cell with different numbers of electrodes. So there's my honest Rigoni plot. If I take the same electrode material and I do the calculation with coin cells, we can see it's now appearing right up here in the top right hand corner, which is orders of magnitude better in performance than we actually get in the device. So part of this work was looking at how we can scale between these. So given the fact that I actually made the final devices, I can get a realistic and accurate um, percentage of active material that's going into um, into these devices. So I can apply that mass scaling there. And also I put in, I multiply my number by 0.75 because in the real devices, we only cycle to half of the voltage limit. So we get three quarters of the energy. And you can see it's this line in the middle here. Even by going through this scaling process, we still don't get the right values that we're looking for. We still don't match with what we get in the final um, devices. So we put this together. And we can now add in an additional scaling factor, um, which is dependent on the cell format and the cell size. And you can see now, regardless of which electrode we go, we're now fitting in that area. Just to emphasize this point very briefly, that there's a lot that needs to be thought about in the cell engineering. Um, some recent work on designing of um, cylindrical cells, looking at the ESR, the equivalent series resistance in supercaps, which um, is the order of merit um, for industrial devices and also defines the power handling. Keep the electrolyte, electrode, separator, amount of electrolyte and everything the same. And just change a few things in here. You can see from a standard design, an ESR of 35 milliohms. I take out the PTC element, which is a positive temperature coefficient fuse. It is often found in batteries. And we see a significant drop. Then by adding additional tabs, sorry, the last two columns are the wrong way round. Um, it should be nine and then seven. By adding additional tabs and then optimizing the tab design, we can drop this down again to seven milliohms. So in the device, by changing the engineering, and it's only minor changes, 
we've dropped by a factor of five. So hopefully this has shown you there is merit in making prototypes and some of the reasons why scientifically it is of interest. So let's now take a look and see about the various steps involved in cell making. So there's a common trend that goes through regardless of what scale you're working at, um, whether it's to make a very, very small electrode for a coin cell or you're making kilometers of electrode in production. So the first part, you're gonna have a mixing process for your ink, coating and drying, and then calendaring. Beyond that, we have common themes, but differences depending on your cell size and format around your cutting or slitting of your electrodes, assembly, welding, packaging, and then going through to your electrolyte processes, um, finally aging and grading. So if we think about the requirements that we have in making an electrode at the coin cell, we're looking for a formulation to maximize the active material capacity. We want to understand the absolute best that this new material can provide for us. Um, so we, can, we also want an electrode that is probably consistent over a number of centimeters because we're going to be cutting out these coin cell discs. Um, we don't really have many flexible or flexibility or mechanical considerations as long as we're careful making the cell. A lot of the problems and also adhesion, it just needs to be okay. Um, a lot of the problems around mechanical and flexibility um, and adhesion problems can be fixed with a spring in a coin cell. If you go, however, to a prototype or production, the formulation now changes. We now need to maximize the amount of active material in there. Um, so we want far, far more active material in the electrode so we can maximize the capacity of the electrode itself rather than the active material. We typically want to be able to go to higher loadings the exception on this is there are some very high power devices that go to some very low loadings. And we want consistency. I look for consistency over tens of meters in prototyping. In production, to be honest, they're probably looking over kilometers um, with very, very tight control. And the control that they get now over these processes is simply mind blowing um, what they can do. We need no cracking in our electrodes. We need good flexibility. And I say excellent adhesion. There are exceptions to this. There are some very niche um, electrodes where the adhesion is not necessarily um, as important. And the thickness needs to be tailored to application. Now we will, depending on the application and depending on the materials we work with, we will balance um, considerations in this list of things. But as you can see, there are a lot of differences that we see. So the formulation, typically in the lab scale, I think everybody at some point who has worked on developing a cell will have used either the 80-10-10 or 70-20-10 formulation, which refers to the active material, the carbon black or conductive additive that's put in there, and a binder. And this gives a high enough conductivity and a high capacity of your active material, but not for your electrode necessarily. When you go to prototype or production, you're looking at over 90% of your active material, but this can be as high as 99% in um, some very specialized cases. Incidentally, when you get to the 99%, that's when the adhesion starts to become a problem. Um, and it's used in some very specific applications. So going through, you try and minimize the binder and the carbon black content going through and have as much active material in there. And you know, your balance changes in your formulation and prototype, depending on your application, your active material. So to give an example, there are some types of LFP, lithium ion phosphate, where you may want a higher amount of binder going in there than maybe you do with a, an MC or an NCA due to the properties of the material. So all of this, we put this together, we get our formulation right and we go on to, we'll now talk about some of the mixing and how we produce an electrode. What we want is the perfect case of a good electrode in action. And this very, very nice cartoon um, that was presented at AABC Europe in 2018, um, I think illustrates the situation very, very nicely. So you can see we've got our active material. We have a very nice conducted network of, um, of carbon black or our conductive particles. We, we join to our current collector. We can get our electrolyte to where it needs to go, go to properly. We've got diffusion in, inside the solids and everything is working beautifully. Now, this is what we always want, but there's almost always some elements that aren't quite there. So give an example of a very bad electrode in action, again, taken from the same um, conference. We can see here what can go wrong. So we can have increased tortuosity if we calendar too hard, we can block off parts of the electrode. Um, we can have inhomogeneous mixing. 
Um, you can see in the bottom right on the cathode, um, we have no conductive um, connections here. So we're going to lose some of this active material. We have disconnected materials that may be sitting there without the binder. We're not going to see these in capacity. We can have poor adhesion to a current collector and it can wind off. There are so many things that can go wrong inside an electrode if everything is not just right. So the formulation, mixing and coating conditions are absolutely critical. So the question comes, if we look at this in, in, in stages, um, what properties are we looking for in a well mixed thing? And this applies as much to something you may do with a pestle and mortar in the very, very early mixing stages, right through to full production. So our inks must be stable and they must be of the correct viscosity and solid content. Okay, so they must be stable. The question that comes from that is how long must they be stable for? The simple answer is long enough to be able to go through the rest of the process to make your electrode. Correct solids and viscosity, these must match the coating technology that you're going to use, whether it's a drawdown coater, whether you're doing it by hand, um, or whether you're doing it by spray coating or from a slot by full production. We must achieve the required dispersion and deagglomeration of all of the particles. We must go through this mixing process and make sure everything is where it needs to be so it can set in the electrode. Now, as you find going through these processes, it can be in several stages and you may need to use more than one technology to go through. A good example of this is carbon black. Um, and I'll refer to the carbon black several times through the presentation. It is, I, I refer to it as a very necessary evil. The carbon black, you cannot make a lot of these electrodes without a conductive additive, which is normally a carbon black, but it can be challenging to work with, particularly in terms of its dispersion. Um, Mixing times as you go through to these, uh, as you go through, mixing times are generally longer than you would expect as you go to larger scales. I very rarely do any mixing that takes less than three or four hours. Um, and it's not uncommon for the mixing to take a whole day or longer. And you can find that as you put more and more complex additives into your system, the order of addition of your components can be very, very important. So mixing technologies that um, I would typically use and that can be encountered, on the top, we've got the mixing technologies that I use in my laboratory at the moment. And these are fairly common throughout SuperCap and battery industry. On the left-hand side, you have the Thinky Mixer by Intertronics, um, which is an off-centered planetary mixer. So what you have is, it works in a very similar uh, method to a um, planetary ball mill, but without the balls inside there. So you have an off-axis rotation of a cup which introduces very, very high shear forces. Now the Thinky Mixer can mix just about anything. It's a fantastic mixer um, and can also be scaled down to very small amounts. It does suffer, however, from the problems of not being scalable to the very large scale. Um, although it sounds like a large scale, you struggle to go beyond about 10 kilos of Thinky mixing. Um, in the middle, you have a dispersal mixer, which is an impeller blade which is uh, rotated at high speeds. Uh, the one that you see in the photo there will go up to about 8,000 RPM. So in food terms, I often refer to these mixing technologies in terms of where you would find them in the kitchen. This is your smoothie maker. This is what you're going to make your whipped cream with. It's a very, very similar technology, just more precise and faster. If you go on to the right hand side, we're now looking towards something that will transfer directly to industry. This is a dual planetary mixer. And if you can just see in there, we have our disperser blade, which is the same technology as the middle mixer, but we also have um, stirring blades that are put down. Now these are more like your bread maker or a dough making. So these will knead your ink together and give a different type of mixing and allow you to work at higher solid contents and thicker, um, thicker inks. And you can see on the bottom line, um, this is the technology that's predominantly used in manufacture at the moment. And you can see the setup of the blades in the bottom left. And then the two other pictures are taken of a colleague um, at Ampty Power in Thurso in the north of Scotland. You can see this is a 250, I think 200 or 250 litre mixer in this technology. As we go through the mixing technologies, you may also want to look at some dry mixing. Now, this is becoming more common in some applications. You can go through simple mixing from something like a rotary drum, or you'll now find a high energy mixer, such as the one marketed by Hosokawa here, which can really blend the particles together. And why would we want to do this? So this would be done before you get to your 
later mixing stage. One manufacturer in particular, Irich, is starting to come onto the market here, which can which can boast some very, very quick mixing times because of this technology. So it gives advantages that you can blend your active materials together and you can help with your distribution and deagglomeration of your um, conductive additives such as carbon black. It can also help reduce the vis viscosities you get in the mixing. So allow you to get higher solid contents and lower processing costs. But the one thing you must be careful of is over mixing. And this is common to all of the mixing technologies, but can be more of an issue with the dry mix. Just before we go on to the overmixing, one that I will mention just in passing that is now becoming um, a feature in some of the newer factories in production is a continual mixing. This is taken from the Bueller website. You can see it's based on a screw, um, twin screw extrusion technology um, with a lot more in there than just simple twin screw extrusion. Um, so this will give a continual production of ink. We go back to the overmixing now. We can see here three considerations, uh, three mixing scenarios um, depicted um, in the cartoons on the right hand side. Now, if you look at these in the top, top image, you can see the large blue balls being the active material and then the gray black part being the carbon black. Now this carbon black comes as a heavily agglomerated um, powder, but is made up of sort of tens of nanometer or smaller um, size individual particles that are agglomerated. If you don't disperse it well enough, you're going to get a situation like you see in the first image, where you've got some connection between some of your um, active materials. If you get your dispersion right, you end up with the second image, where you've got some dispersion of your carbon black, but it can come back together and it can form these chains between the active material particles. So you get a network of connected particles. They're connected by the backbone, um, the, the conductive black bone, backbone, um, from the carbon black. If you look at the last image, you can see the situation where you've mixed too much. So if you overmix when you're using something like a carbon black, you can end up coating all of your particles with all of your carbon black and it will not re-agglomerate. So what you find is some particles are connected, but your performance will drop because you don't have the full connection. And you can see this shown in the rate behavior in the graph um, here going through different mixing technologies. Now, one thing that I would say, um, if you're looking to see how consistent, how effective your mixing is, one thing that I do like to look at is look at the rate behavior over a number of cells. If you've got very effective and consistent mixing throughout your electrodes, you do a number of repeats. And if they are close together, if they're closely matched in performance at the lower rate, you will also see a closely matched performance at the higher rate. If your cells tend to drift apart and your spread of data gets much wider at the higher rate, it could indicate that you maybe need to look at your electrode um, production again. So if we move on to coating, um, the common ways of coating that we'll see at the moment, um, I think the most common we'll see is the drawdown table that we can see on the left hand side. So in here we can see we would just put a um, substrate foil of typically aluminium or copper on one of these tables, which would then be held down by a vacuum. And at the far end here, we can see what would be a doctor's blade. So it's a flat blade or something that is going to drag some ink that we're gonna put in front of it and flatten it out. And this is really, really effective for small amounts of electrodes. And you can get longer drawdown tables so you can still make larger electrodes. And it's very, very forgiving with your ink and can give a reasonable number of consistency. What you can see on the right-hand side is um, the reel-to-reel -reel coating. So this is on my small comma bar, reverse comma bar coater. And this is typically used for larger amounts of ink. It's faster, it can give higher quality electrodes, but your ink must be just right. So there are various uh, technologies that you'll find in these reel-to-reel -reel coaters. You just saw there a reverse comma bar coater set up, which is what I work with um, in my laboratory. And you can see we have a pond where um, the ink will be put into. And then a comma-shaped bar will lift and a coating roller will take the ink and flatten it out. And then you transfer this onto a foil that passes in the other direction and then go into an oven. More common industrially um, and in production, in fact, almost all coaters industrially now are based on a slot die application. So this is more of an extrusion process, um, which gives exceptionally good control 
of the um, electrode that's produced and the thicknesses and reproducibility. And it's a very well metered and documented process. So to look at a typical production type coater, I've taken this from the Dermegtech website. You can see we would typically have a small ink application area, which you can see at the back side of the coater. Um, then you have a very, very large drying area. And these ovens can be over 50, maybe 100 meters long in some um, production processes. Uh, you've now got the technology available to be able to coat one or two sides at the time. Um, and you can also put these under a controlled environment. And one of the big challenges that comes up is being able to run these coaters as quickly as possible. Um, and for that, you either have a longer drying zone or you may have um, a different type of drying or some completely new technology. So the drying is incredibly critical um, as you go through your process. If you consider how um, electrodes are made on a batch process with your drawdown coater, you can dry your electrodes by leaving them in the fume cupboard with NMP possibly, or on a hot plate, or you could leave them on a bench with a water-based um, system, or you may want to put them into an oven. Um, but you generally give them quite a long time to dry. That's not a luxury that you can have when you go for a reel-to-reel -reel coater. You're probably looking at less than three minutes um, is the absolute maximum you get to dry your, um, to dry your electrodes. And this in, if, if this drying is done incorrectly, you get problems. You can have sedimentation of particles. You can have critical particles themselves migrating through the electrode. A very good example of this is if you work with water-based coatings um, with a common system of CMC and SBR. So SBR being um, styrene butadiene rubber, which is provided as an emulsion. These particles, one of their main functions is to stick your um, electrode to the current collector. And these very small engineered particles can be effectively dragged with the evaporating solvent if you dry too quickly, which can result in delamination of your electrode. You can get other problems around cycle fading, poor rate behavior. And the thing that makes everything more difficult is how hard and how fast you can and must dry will depend on your binder and your system. It's not always the same. So to give you an example from a disaster that I had in some of my work some years ago, um, working on some um, supercapacitors that I was scaling up from a commercially bought activated carbon going for about 900, 1,000 farad cells. So these are fairly large cells. Um, I did all of my background work. I worked with my coin cells. I came up with some results that showed a reasonable equivalent series resistance, nice rate behavior, and a cycle life as good as I would expect in a coin cell. So I did my calculations and I thought in my devices, I'm gonna come up with an equivalent series resistance of about of, of less than 10 million. So I was quite happy. We go through all these stages. And then it came to making, I think it was around 75 meters of electrode, weeks of hard work to make the cells, and you put them on to test. And it was a disaster. So you can see here straight away, you can imagine my horror when the testing came up and I was out by a factor of nearly 20 in my series resistance. So I still remember I went home. I cried a little bit um, when I came back in the following day and thought, right, it's time to cut these cells open and see what's happened. And it turns out I had a delamination problem. As soon as the, the electrodes seem to have great um, adhesion, but as soon as I opened, as soon as I put them in contact with the electrolyte, they came off. And you can see that happening in the um, picture in the inset. So after looking at the various parts here, I thought this could be due to the drying. So what you can see here, the test you can see here, is I've changed the drying conditions in the reel-to-reel -reel coating, um, and then immersed a flag of the electrode into some electrolyte and checked the adhesion. As you can see, for this particular system, as I increased the drying temperature, this got better and better adhesion. So after I'd worked all of these out, it was time to see if we were correct. And you can see here, this is a cell that was cycled, um, and we can see the adhesion before I'd open the cell up and everything would come off. Oops, sorry, if I just go back. Um, you can see a video here now of me rubbing the cell. So you can see here, it's not gonna move. It's excellent adhesion even after cycling, um, right up to the point where we start damaging the electrode. And then looking at the various results for the cells that were produced, now we are well below 10 milliohms, back where we expect it to be. So hopefully you can see, we do have to think about these things such as the drying. Um, calendaring is the next stage that we'll look at. And this is very simply the compression 
of the electrode and the current collector together. And you can do this in a number of ways. We often do it at higher temperatures. Um, and you can put something through a fixed pressure or through a fixed size gap to reduce the area it goes through. And this can increase the density and the adhesion. And by bringing everything together can increase the conductivity of the electrode as well. You've got to be careful though, if you go too far, you can cause problems with wetting. You can't get your electrolyte to go into um, your final cell. Sort of counterintuitively, if you compress too hard, you can end up delaminating. The material will bounce back and come apart. You come up with things like dry patches um, occurring in your electrode when it comes to the electrolyte wetting. So again, to show you an example of this, again in supercaps, we can see a study that I was doing on just looking at the effects of calendaring. So as the density is increased on a very, very porous um, activated carbon, you can see I reach a point here. It doesn't really matter about the specific capacitance and the different rates. You can see what's happening here. We're bouncing back and we're losing some of this density. And you can see down here in the ESR measurements, you can see everything starts to go, go wrong. So if I made cells beyond this circle point here, I, I would have problems. And um, that is what I found from the study. So moving on to, we've spoken a little bit about the common, pro, common points. Now I'd just like to talk briefly over the various stages that are involved in making a pouch cell and a cylindrical cell, and maybe look, finish off by looking at what's coming um, or what I believe the next thing um, to come along is gonna be. So if you think of a pouch cell, pouch cell is effectively made up of an interleaving of the anode and cathode and the separator going between them. And one of the more common methods of doing this is what we would call a Z-fold stack. So you have a anode, which has been punched out to the correct shape, and you put separator over one side, and then you put the cathode on top. And I've got a short video um, coming up that'll show you this process. What you're then left with is a wound stack of these cells um, with some um, a flag of copper and a flag of aluminium typically in a battery or two flags of aluminium in a supercapacitor coming up. And then you ultrasonically weld all of the cathodes together with a tab and do the same for the anodes together with a tab there. We then go through a simple pouch press. We prepare a casing for this to go through, typically with a cold press technique. And this casing is a laminated aluminium uh, material. And this is very often, um, it, it's similar to what you'd find in a coffee bag. Um, but it's much, much higher grade. It's much, much higher specification and thicker to make sure you don't get air or um, oxygen or moisture coming through. Then you go through a sealing process where you'll seal three edges and then finally fill with electrolyte um, and move forward to the various formation stages um, that come on to give you a pouch cell. So one thing just to mention here at this stage, the single layer pouch cells. So I would say about these, these are something in between the multi-layer pouch cell that I mentioned, and also the coin cells. And these are a, a very, very useful tool in developing cells. So what you're effectively doing is you will take one electrode of cathode, you'll put a little bit, you'll put a layer of separator in between, and then one layer of cathode on top. And you put this in the pouch material. And these are very, very good because they allow you to get now area specific performance. They'll allow you to go to much higher currents. Um, so you can take away some of the issues you may see with the separators. At higher rate testing. They're good for parameterizing models. So for instance, you can now reliably do HPPC testing and they're excellent for looking at cell balance, um, your balance of your anode and cathode. Um, they also give a very good indication around your mixing and electrode quality, but they don't generally include the mass of your packaging in there and they still don't give as much thermal data. There are some considerations if you're looking at these, you need more electrode for this. Um, because it's larger than the coin cell. Also, you, you benefit from a better quality electrode. And I would say this is the point where you move away from your glass fiber separators. Um, the testing may need higher currents and often you'll require ultrasonic welding, but there are ways around this, which if anybody would like to contact me afterwards, if you're interested, I could discuss. Just briefly, I mentioned the Z-fold stacking. So you can see this pictorially here and you can see the cells popping up one on top of each other and your separator interleaving going through. There's a variation of this process, a very nice variation of this process from LG, which I'll come to, but just to show you this working, the stacking working, as we go through, we have this very short video. So you can see the pickup of the electrode, the move to the middle, fingers are holding it in place, 
and the separator is going over the top. Okay, so LG Chem have come up with a very, very nice alternative process for this. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll probably skip through a little bit of this video um, to get us to the point where they start talking about this. Okay, so leading on from that, just the points on there, you can see LG have got a very innovative solution there. And one thing to mention here is in the manufacturing process, one of the slower steps in the manufacturing is the stacking. So you can see the winding processes are generally much, much quicker than the slower stacking processes. We move on to cylindrical cells. Um, the difference here, there's a number of differences. We're now looking at winding something up and putting it in a hard cased can, which has a number of advantages um, going through here. Now, if we consider um, how we make these cells, the first difference is we start off with the same electrode, but instead of cutting it into individual, um, into individual electrodes and stacking them together, we're now gonna wind these together. And we're gonna wind these with a separator going down the middle. Now, depending on your technology, you'll do this in a number of ways. If you think of a traditional battery, um, you'll see in a video coming up, your separator um, go straight, you, you, your electrodes sit inside the boundaries of the separator, so there's no overlap between the edges, and you wind um, so your separator is on the edge of both cells, and you have tabs that come out at the end. Um, I should say the tabs are attached before you go to the winding stage from simple ultrasonic welding. If you look at a supercapacitor um, or the new tabless designs that are being spoken about, it's a slightly different weld setup, and you actually have a situation where your current collector for, for each electrode protrudes on one side of the cell. Your separator still sits in the middle of this area um, and makes sure that you don't get the short circuit going across um, and a short contact going there. But now you're looking at an offset there going through, and you'll see an example of that towards the end. Okay, so depending on which technology you're going for will dictate on how you move forward from here. Um, I'm gonna give you an example of the assembly of a cylindrical cell um, in my laboratory now, going through the various stages. So if we look in the top corner, we can see my small winder here. Um, now, one thing to look at on this winder, this takes me about two minutes to wind an in individual cell. Now, when you look at manufacturing winders, they will wind more than one cell a second or up around that sort of number. Um, much, much faster and a completely automated process that will bring the other parts in. But one advantage we have for these hands-on prototype equipment that you can see here is it allows me to stop at parts of the protest process and put other things in there. So for instance, I can include sensors um, to monitor temperature as an example, reference electrodes as in part of the assembly of the cell. So if we look at the winding process here, we can see we have um, uh, the cathode is being, the anode, sorry, is being fed on the top of the cell. The anode is coming up from um, below. And we can see we're winding together and it's all encompassed in the separator. After it's done, we uh, cut the separator off and we'll then tape and we have our jelly roll ready to go to the next stage. And you can see by putting a, set, by putting a tab on one end of each of the cells, we end up with um, one of the tabs at the center of the jelly roll and one of the tabs at the outside of the jelly roll. So the one at the outside is going to be the anode. You can see in the second video here, we now need to put this in a can. So what I've done is I've bent over that tab so it's down the center of the cell. And we're gonna put it in the can and then use the gap that was in the winding mandrel that the separator was put around to be able to put a welding needle down through the bottom and give it a resistance weld, a deep can weld as it would be called. Beyond that, we now need to put a groove in the can to hold the jelly roll firmly in place, um, but also to allow us to later crimp it. Oh, sorry, just go back. So you can see here, the grooving process here, it's a manual process, whereby we just spin the can and we bring down a blunted blade um, to actually put this groove through there. 
Moving on to the next stage, we have an ultrasonic welding where we'll attach the can to the tab that's at the top. And this is more commonly done in production by laser welding now. We then go into introducing the electrolyte and also um, we'll dry the cell um, completely, I should say. Um, and then we introduce the electrolyte in a controlled environment before we give it its final crimping, what you can see here. So this is a mechanical crimp that's going in, in this case. Um, in production, you would normally find this is more of a rolling process. So you roll the edges over. And that should give you your cell. Just very briefly to finish off, um, the areas that I'm going to talk about now, I could fill an hour longer of talking, but, but I'm not going to, obviously. I'd be happy to discuss if anybody has any questions around this. We will inject our electrolyte into the cell. This is where now we need to be careful about how much electrolyte we put in there. Um, and one of the things that we look at is being able to do this in one stage so it doesn't hold up a manufacturing process. Whereby this is quite straightforward in a pouch cell because you have plenty of room to put your electrolyte and you can then leave it to soak in. If you're looking at a cylindrical cell, we'll typically do this under vacuum. So we'll take the cell to a vacuum and introduce the electrolyte there to help the electrolyte to soak in because there's not a lot of physical room before the electrolyte is absorbed in the can. Beyond that, the cells then have to go through a common stage, which, you're, which is also obviously performed in the coin cell, of formation, degassing, and grading. Now, the degassing aspect will happen in a pouch cell, not normally in a cylindrical cell or a coin cell. And, you know, for your formation, you're looking at a slow first charge, which can have varying degrees of complexity, depending on what you're working with. And these formation protocols are closely guarded secrets for some manufacturers. They may take an extended period of time. They may stop at certain states of charge. And this is to allow a stable SEI um, solid electrolyte interface to be um, drawn up. And this, this, when you come to the larger production, this has a large capex cost associated with it. So there's a lot of interest in reducing this time. You then typically go on to a grading process and you can grade your cells, which are the A grade cells with the closest match performance for this customer and so on and so forth. Whilst we don't do formation in supercaps, we do also do a process which is similar in some ways. We just call it a testing protocol, a training protocol, or a grading protocol um, that goes straight to it. So we've seen enough about where the technology is now. I'm just about out of time. So the question that I always pose is where do we go next? So there's been some exciting developments in the um, battery industry. And there's, there's a lot of things that we see happening with pouch cells, things such as these large blade cells, um, new technologies. And we hear an awful lot about solid state, which is um, offering great potential for the future. But one thing that I found particularly um, particularly uh, nice in, in, in the last 12 months is the tabless designed um, 4680 cell from Tesla that was announced. And one thing that I do very much like with this is it shows the, the synergies and the crossover between technology from the supercap um, areas that they will have acquired from their Maxwell technology and also the design of cells in um, the battery field. So obviously they are now focusing very much on the dry battery electrode process, which is coming into the manufacture from the supercaps. But the engineers have taken this further and taken a standard sort of offset tabless design you find in a supercap that you can see from a disassembled device at the bottom there. And they've now managed to include this to be able to work with copper, for instance. So we can see here now they have a tabless design that they're working on. Beyond this, this is just information that came out from their initial battery day press release, which is allowing them to go to this much larger cell um, to allow us to get better thermal rejection, better uh, a lower resistance and so on. So I think a nice point for me to sh finish off with here is the video that they put up on their Twitter account that just shows, I've shown you a small pilot line. This is a line that they still term as a pilot line. And uh, you can see the size and what they're doing now.
Okay. So I, I still remember complete joy and happiness at my first prototype um, in pouch and cylindrical cell, and then going to making 10 cells in a week, and then 100 cells in a week, and along come Tesla, and they term their pilot line making over 10,000 cells. Um, so as you can see, there are no boundaries, there are no firm boundaries, as I said in the first slide, between where prototyping ends and pilot starts, and then moving on to the production as well. So thank you very, very much for your attention. I hope you found this interesting. Just give a few acknowledgements here, um, particularly around the funding of the work that you've seen. Um, I'd like to thank the EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council um, in the UK, particularly around their MREX project um, for funding a lot of the work. The Faraday Institution in particular um, for heavily supporting me um, currently through an industrial uh, Faraday Institution Industrial Fellowship and also the Centre for Advanced Low Carbon Propulsion Systems at Coventry University where I work. And if you have any further questions um, or there's something that we don't cover, I'd be very, very happy to speak with you and also collaborate in areas in the future. And I'd now be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Very lovely piece of uh, talk. Great talk, actually. And uh, there is a few questions here. So uh, if you don't mind, <laughs> I, I write the first one here. I just uh, give a brainstorm. We are having some issues with uh, um, the laminations. And um, uh, I was wondering if there is a secret, a special secret for uh, the coating, because we are following the recipe pe people report in, at internet, as we discussed in the past. But uh, we also are worried about, is there um, some um, secrets on, uh, for example, aluminum roofiness? Maybe it's, uh, 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 if we have, for example, a very flat surface, or should we um, uh, purchase uh, some etched aluminum? Or, for example, the dry process, if we dry for a very long time, is that helpful uh, or not? Or, um, and this kind of things, if you can uh, give you uh, some types, uh, some tips, sorry, some yeah. tips. Okay. And we'll be yeah. very happy. Okay, so um, there's a number of number of different areas here, and it is a very very large um, sort of field in there. So one of the things is um, depending on the active, depending on the materials you're mixing, some are a lot worse. Some are some are a lot more difficult to get the adhesion right than others. Um, so one that I mentioned before, and it's not all of these um, LFPs, but LFP is a, is a good example of a material that it goes to the nano size a lot of the time, and that can mean that you have to go to higher levels of binder, and you can look in very specialized ways of doing this. Um, another area you mentioned about a very, very smooth surface, you can get um, advantages to using a roughened or a very specific foil. Um, so there are some very nice um, foils. I, 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 I tend to use etched aluminum um, quite a lot um, for working super caps, and especially in high power applications because it has this slight advantage in adhesion and also in resistance. And then there are some very nice carbon coated foils from companies such as Armour, um, such as Armour Group, that they can tailor the property to give you some help in the adhesion. So you can look at it in that way. Um, the other thing um, that I would say is look at your drying. Look at how quickly you're drying. So if you're working with, um, if you're working with an aqueous binder system, such as a PAA or CMC and SBR, then you may want to look at, you could be drying too quickly. So the first tip I'd say to you for that is if you're doing this on a drawdown coater and you're doing an aqueous drying, don't put it in an oven. Okay, don't put it in an oven to start with. Just leave it there, air dry, and it'll tell you, know, even, even going sort of 150 microns, get it so it's sort of dry to touch, um, that sort of level of dryness, and leave it take its time to do that. You then take it from this point, after you've fixed everything in there, you then take it and put it in the oven and you can bake it out at sort of 120 degrees to get all of that water out of there. If you're using a non-aqueous system um, and you're having this problem, see about drying harder, see about drying faster. And also, you know, if, if we're working with PVDF, not every PVDF is the same. Um, one thing I would say is speak to the manufacturers. I, I generally find that your binder manufacturers, if you phone up their sales office, they're very, very happy 
um, to help you solve the problems um, in that way. They may be able to suggest a different chain length of polymer that goes in there. Well, thank you very much. There's also a question uh, from uh, João Pedro. Uh, good morning, Alex. Um, thank you for the presentation and share all the exciting piece of uh, knowledge with us. Can you talk a little about the experience with the proper level of compression in the manufacturing of electrodes and uh, a cell compression to multi-layer supercapacitor and batteries is critical or, or variable? And uh, how do you find appropriate level of compression? So by the compression, are we talking about the calendaring of the electrode or are we talking about a compression of the cell intestine? Uh, can we go for both? Is that is okay? There time? All right. Okay. So the ca the calendaring of the electrode, you're you're always fighting against yourself here. You want to get that density as high as possible. Okay. You always want to be really calendaring hard um, so that you can get the maximum amount of material into as small a volume as possible. And there are definite benefits from doing this in terms of the conductivity. But as I mentioned before, if you go too far, you start to have these problems. Mm -hmm. Now, the the honest, way is, the honest way of looking at this, you can model it and everything else, but there's no substitute for going through the actual experimental processes. So some of this is trial and error and the learning that you get from it. Mm -hmm. So through your calendaring process, when you get to the very, very large calendars, um, they may fix a gap, put your electrode through there, and then increase the levels of compression as you go through and see how much compression you get on your cell, on your electrode. You're going to get to a point where you're, current collector is gonna to start to tear. You know you've definitely gone too far at that point. Okay, but what you, what you get out of these are different levels of compression, and then you have to test them. You have to look at the properties that are going through. All of this development is very test intensive. Um, you can help with compression um, from putting in um, some compression additives. Things such as there are, there are certain graphites that can go in there um, that you can find that will help with compression. If you're seeing graphite going in, in sort of 1% in a recipe and somebody, and you're assuming it's a conductive additive and there's carbon black already there, it's probably not. It's probably there as a compression additive and you can get higher degrees of compressibility that way. When it comes to the testing, um, there is a degree of compression that you will put on a test on a cell to mirror what you'll get in, mirror what you'll get in application. And this does help with the testing. And again, this is something that you need to look at the cells you're working with. Um, and address different level, levels of compression. So it's going to be different varying uh, based on the technology you're using and how much your cell is going to expand. Thank you very much, Thanks. Alex. One last question uh, from Rafael Guimarães Pereira. Uh, are you currently using machine learning uh, approach or co uh, with the process engineering okay. challenge or optimization? I'll be, I'll be honest with you. It's something that I should be using. Um, and it's something that I know colleagues are looking at, um, particularly some of the larger centers that we have in the UK, um, where they look at higher numbers of manufacture. Um, I think it's an area where there's huge amounts of information that can be had with there. And as I believe at the Faraday Institution um, in the UK has a project running, which is looking at this sort of machine learning to inform and improve on manufacture. For me at the moment, I'm not making the volume and number of cells Whereby, it, whereby I can look at it in, in one go. But I do think it's going to be invaluable in the future. Thank you very much, Alex, again, to find time to be with us today and to share all this great knowledge that uh, all our divisions are going to explore. And of course, we're going to discuss with you uh, future collaborations, uh, student exchange and all this kind of stuff. So we are very happy for you to find this time to be with us today. Thank you very much once again. Thank you for your invite and thanks for your attention. Thank you. Our pleasure. So uh, now we are moving forward and uh, I'm very happy to present uh, Professor Anna Hawking uh, from the Department of Chemical Engineering from, uh, from Imperial College London. Um, She's a lecturer and uh, she have performed she, uh, her PhD, uh, PhD and uh, postdoc there. Um, she is associated editor from uh, Frontiers Chemical Electro Engineering. And um, also she, she have been doing quite a great piece of uh, science 
And uh, on, the, um, on the electrochemical engineer conversion, water splitting, CO2 reduction, uh, uh, there is a quite a nice piece of science on the um, characterization of semiconductor and the electrolyte interface. So uh, I know a lot of people here are interested on uh, um, electrify interface. So she, she also work on a, a microkinetics modeling of a photoelectrochemical process, design characterization and modeling of a scale photoelectrochemical reactors. So thank you once again, Anna, to be here with us today. And uh, uh, please um, have the room for you and uh, we'd be more than happy to hear you and uh, discuss science. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much for the warm uh, welcome. And I'm extremely grateful for the invitation to, to speak to you today. Um, so as, as, as Hudson mentioned, I've, I've, I've recently taken up the position of lecturer at Imperial College London in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And this is actually one of my very first invited talks outside of Imperial College. So I'm particularly, particularly excited. Um, um, so I've been at Imperial, as Hudson said, my, my entire career. I started off uh, doing an undergraduate degree in physics um, in 2003. And then I moved into the Department of Chem Chemical Engineering to do a PhD on electrochemistry and electrochemical engineering. So it was a very big change for me. I had to learn a lot of chemistry that I hadn't actually done since since uh, I was about 16 years old but um, it took a while for me to to fall in love with electrochemistry but now it's 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 really become a proper passion of mine and it's quite different to my original plan to become an astronomer which is what I thought I would be uh, before I started my my physics degree so um so I've been doing the lectureship a little bit over a year now and I've set up my own group. It's called the Electrochemical Systems Laboratory. And we work on quite a number of different projects. And the overall objectives is to find uh, electrochemical solutions to some of the most pressing industrial problems. So besides what I'm going to talk about today, um, I do work on mater electrochemical material recovery. So for example, recovering heavy metals from industrial wastewater. We also do recycling of materials from, for example, lithium ion batteries. We do work on corrosion and also recently um, some work on electrolyzer development. So developing 3D porous structures for use in, in electrolyzers. Um, and the typical approach that we take in the work is always to start on the small scale. So, for example, we look at individual reactions at individual electrodes, uh, we characterize the materials, we model reaction rates, and after we've understood the individual processes, we then start to put the whole complete system together and operate it as a whole, characterize it and model that. So we go through stages where we do small scale experiments, we form microkinetic models. So for example, current is a function of potential. And then we import those into larger multi physics models that can describe things like concentration gradients, pH changes, um, what happens as a function of time. And they help us to really operate the processes as efficiently and as most economically uh, as possible. But the particular interest I want to, to talk about today is the production of uh, renewable hydrogen. And I think the slide will shift. I have some very large images in the presentation. So if I click too many times, it will be too many slides that's skipping through. Right. So, I mean, uh, I'm sure you would have all heard about this, you know, the need to, to, to generate hydrogen and the role that it can play in decarbonizing various industrial sectors. Um, we know that hydrogen at the moment is made predominantly by steam methane reforming. And unless the CO2 emissions uh, associated with that process are captured um, and um, placed on the ground, sequestered, uh, then the process is not really environmentally sustainable, although it's currently one of the cheapest ones. And the way to make uh, hydrogen fuel renewably is it, something that can be done today already. So you can take a solar panel, so a photovoltaic, and couple it with an electrolyzer. 
So you have two devices that perform two separate functions. So the photovoltaic panels absorb uh, solar photons and convert them to electrical energy. And then that electrical energy is directly used to power an electrolyzer, which splits water into hydrogen and oxygen. But these systems have historically been developed completely separately from each other. So when you couple them together, it's not necessarily uh, an optimized operation. So quite, quite often you need power electronics uh, to make the system work as efficiently as possible. And this adds to the complexity of the design. We know that electrolyzers, especially polymer electrolyte membranes, they use a lot of platinum group metal. So there's there, there, there's a lot of capital costs. Anna, so Anna, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, are we going to share your presentation? Because I think you didn't share it. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to go back some slides. <laughs> Is it better now? That's yeah, but now. go back some slides for us to, to see I them. I have actually yes. been through, through a lot of slides. So this was my first slide and this is where I talked about myself. Okay. So so actually, thank you for letting me know. I, having practiced putting up my presentation for about 15 minutes earlier, I then forgot to do it at the most important uh, point. Don't worry, it happens. Thank you. Right, so I'm talking about the image on the left where you have two <laughs> the schematic that shows two separate systems essentially coupled together, right? So, I mean, yes, I, we all know that uh, there are some, 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 um, economic issues associated with this approach and would very much like to generate hydrogen more cheaply from solar energy. So here comes the part that I'm interested in, which is photoelectrochemical systems. So essentially photoelectrochemical systems are PV and electrolyzer morphed into this two-in-one system. So this one single system will perform the function of absorbing light um, and then catalyzing electrochemical reactions so that you irradiate a device and you get hydrogen and oxygen directly uh, out of it. Now, it sounds like a very elegant solution because, well, instead of having two devices, long cables, transmission lines, power electronics, you just immerse the you know, semiconductors into, into, the, um, into one device and get your hydrogen out. But in practice, this has turned out to be an extremely difficult system to get to work in, in, in an efficient way that makes any kind of commercial sense. So for example, just to illustrate, if you take a silicon, um, a silicon PV and you remove the glass protective layer and you just immerse that silicon into your uh, electrolyte, so you, you make it the electrode, um, it'll dissolve. So for a little while, it will absorb light just fine. You'll get a bit of hydrogen, but then it will essentially self decompose uh, and that's your electrode gone. And this happens to quite a lot of materials that are very good photo absorbers. So they're great at absorbing light, but they're not sufficiently chemically robust to actually last for any acceptable amount of time. Um, and material development is currently the main essentially bottleneck in the field because it's still been extremely difficult to find materials that are um, uh, that can be produced sustainably uh, that are not platinum group metals uh, and that are chemically robust, uh, great uh, uh, catalyzing reactions um, and good photo absorbers at the same time. Uh, and so this research is still very much uh, ongoing. But what I'm more interested in is how to actually de design these systems, assuming you, someone else has already developed the materials. So how do you, what, what do these systems actually look like? You can picture a field of PVs and an electrolyzer, but what would an industrial uh, installation of photoelectrolyzers actually look like? So, so how will these systems be structured? So just to, recap a bit about how complicated it has been to actually um, 
design and perfect photovoltaic installations in the first place. So it's not like it's easy to do PVs and electrolyzers, and it's very hard to do photoelectrolyzers. Um, you have plenty of constraints and complexities on the two individual systems. So with photovoltaic installations, you can have um, yeah, fixed angle installations. That means that you basically just take your solar panels and position them at a fixed angle and they stand like that all year long. And sometimes of year you get more um, electrical energy, sometimes you get less. Um, but of course, you get the most out of a PV um, if it's positioned normal to, to the rays of the incoming sun. And given that the sun actually, well, moves across the sky, let's say, uh, you get more out if the PVs actually track the movement of the sun throughout the day. Uh, again, this can happen in two ways. They can track it along one axis, or this image on the bottom right is for systems that actually move, um, change their, their position along two axes, so to, to, to really maximize the output of the day. But of course, the more you get out of the system, the more complicated it actually is. The more it can break, the more maintenance it, it requires. And on top of the tracking, you also can use all sorts of different uh, optical components to try and enhance the amount of light that uh, reaches the PV surface. Because ideally, if you ignore all sorts of um, heating effects, um, the, the output current from a PV is proportional to the intensity of light that, that hits it. So if you maximize, if you use reflectors or Fresnel lenses to concentrate the light, you get more, more out. And it makes particular sense when you have very expensive uh, photovoltaic materials, so, such as um, triple junction solar cells, for example, gallium arsenide, um, gallium indium phosphide. Um, the, they're extremely expensive, sort of many thousands of dollars per square meter. So if you use uh, optical components, you can concentrate light uh, onto them. And then, um, and often you need to cool these systems as well. So um, for Fresnel lens and parabolic dish systems, you always have a cooling fluid to extract heat from the, the solar panels so that they don't degrade. Right, so that's solar panels. And then you have electrolyzers, um, which have had their own development history. And normally they are now very compact devices. They operate at very high current densities, so thousands of amps per square meter. Um, in a stack of cells, you normally get um, a multitude, so 10, for example, uh, uh, just <laughs> as a random example, um, 10 electrolyzer cells stacked within one device and they can operate, for example, in a bipolar arrangement so that you only need to make electronic connections at two ends. And these systems come with their own balance of plants. So it's not just the electrolyzer you need to think about. You need to think about the water purification and how to remove the, the gases, you know, heat exchanges, uh, compressors, and all, all, all of these things. And when we actually look at what's happened to photoelectrochemical reactors and how they were designed. It's a completely different story. Um, but so far, obviously, coupling photovoltaics and electrolyzers has been tried industrially. There's not so, information, not so much information about that. But there have been academic studies, for example, this one by General Motors, which said, OK, we're going to have this electrolyzer system. We're going to have these PVs. We'll characterize them separately, you know, the efficiencies as a function of radiation and all of that. And then we're going to put them together and see how much hydrogen we get. Um, and they ended up with a solid hydrogen conversion efficiency of something like 8.2%. Um, uh, percent. And they produce some very nice numbers about how much hydrogen you can expect as a function of solar insulation through and they did their experiments for for some months so it's a very interesting study so now we compare this image to some of the examples of photoelectrochemical uh, system demos that have come out in recent years from 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 different researchers and you can see that the reactors are the reactors or the, the cells are considerably more rudimentary so they more resemble kind of what textbook pictures look like of immersing just two electrodes in a beaker. And that's that's electrolysis. So they're a lot more like that. And they're much more small scale than PV and electrolyzer installations are. So particularly the two images on the top left, uh, the electrodes are of order one centimeter squared. 
Um, and you can see a few different designs as well. So for example, in the middle one on the top, um, there are two electrodes. So one for hydrogen, one for oxygen. There is nothing separating the gases, but the one on the top left is just one sheet and it's got its electrodes on either side of the sheet. So fundamentally different designs. Um, designs on the bottom row uh, are a bit more advanced. The one at TPFL, I think, is definitely going to be the largest um, generator of hydrogen. So that's a seven meter diameter parabolic dish, uh, and it will concentrate light onto some triple junction solar cells. But those solar cells will actually be outside of an electrolyzer. So it's still PV plus electrolysis, but the idea there is that the solar cells are in direct thermal contact with the electrolyzer. So there is an element of integration, just not full integration. And then uh, the image on, on the, on, in the middle on the bottom uh, shows some more traditional photoelectrochemical reactors that use hematite uh, as the oxygen evolving electrode. And there have been different attempts there to use uh, solid larger electrodes or do a more modular structure. So there have been lots of different attempts to tackle all the different issues that are associated with photoelectrochemical reactor design. And some of these differences have been broken down by a colleague of mine who did his PhD at Imperial and has now actually gone to work with Sophia Hausner at, at EPFL. He produced a series of schematic sketches um, of the sort of the, the very con main conceptual differences between some of these systems that essentially do the same thing on the whole when you consider absorption of photons, uh, generation of electron hole pairs, transport of electron hole pairs, and then, um, then electrochemical reactions at the end. So all of these processes happen um, in the same sequence, but the electronic structures that facilitate this transportation of charge are, are completely different. And I show sort of examples of the different um, images that correspond to each schematic. So you can have two electrodes completely separated from each other, that's how it is, for example, in a traditional electrolyzer, uh, an alkaline electrolyzer, the electrodes are separated. Or on the left, you have a more monolithic bipolar structure, which means that on either side of a sheet, you have the electrodes are at different polarities. Um, and despite the similarity to electrolyzer design, everything is complicated by the fact that you actually have to get the light in on these, on these electrodes. And so there are also a series of sketches of how, um, how electrodes can be illuminated. And it depends on whether just one of the electrodes needs to be illuminated or two. And what do you do about it? And how you actually irradiate these electrodes has a fundamental effect on the maximum efficiency of solar energy to hydrogen conversion that you can achieve. So for example, if you illuminate two materials that are side by side, they essentially get the same solar flux. If you illuminate one material through another material, then some of the light will be absorbed by the first material and only a fraction of the solar spectrum will heat the next material. And this um, has, a, has a fundamental effect on the efficiency that you can get out of the system. So then my colleague came up with some, some sketches of all the different device designs that researchers have come up with over the years. Now, I think this was current as of two years ago, but there've been at least three other designs. Um, and these sketches are extremely useful because you can actually tell just from these sketches which device design is fundamentally unscalable i.e. which of these designs you can, you can expand, i.e. make the reactor bigger, and you won't have any increase in performance associated with that. And so what I wanted to talk about in more detail today is what actually limits the performance of a device when you scale it up, which macroscopic effects come into play that limit the performance that aren't necessarily known when you characterize you know, a newly developed material on a millimeter or centimeter squared scale. And just to recap, what is it that we have to think about when designing a photoelectrochemical reactor? Number one, we need to figure out the materials. That's the difficult part. 
how are they going to be synthesized? Are the synthesis methods suitable for creating upscaled electrodes? What are you actually going to deposit your photoelectrodes on? I.e., what's your substrate going to be? And how are you going to make electrical contact to them? That, that last part actually seems really trivial. And on a small scale in the lab where you use crocodile clips, it's you know, not usually a problem. But if you're trying to seal a reactor um, such that you can actually extract and measure gases that come out of it, suddenly electrical contacts pose, pose a big problem and you have to figure out how to make the contacts so as not to have resistive losses you know, in, in the wrong part of the cell. Then how are you going to actually encase these electrodes in your reactor? What's the geometry going to be? What are you going to make your reactor out of? You don't want to make it out of something that will corrode over time. So then how are you going to actually irradiate the reactor? You know, are you going to orientate the whole reactor at the sun? Or are you going to use um, some sort of optical components to guide the light in? And what are you going to do during the day when the position of the sun changes? How do you maximize basically the performance of this reactor? Will you use a membrane to separate the hydrogen and oxygen products? Mm. For situations when there is particularly high cloud cover or nighttime, will you be supplying, you know, um, electricity from the mains or from, from, from a battery or something like that? How are you going to organize your elect um, electrolyte flow circuit? You know, because if you're, if you're splitting water, the water runs out, you have to keep supplying the, the reactant. So you need pumps, you need reservoirs. Um, sometimes you need to maintain the right pH when you need dosing. So um, quite a lot of considerations. And then at the end, there's the question of how to harvest the actual product and, and how to store it. And so all of this begs the question, well, if you want to scale up a system, how big do your electrodes really need to be? So, as I said, a lot of them are being tested on the sort of millimeter squared, centimeter squared scale. So how big are we actually aiming for? Do we want as electrodes as big as an electrolyzer, which could approach something like a meter squared? Or are these systems going to be fundamentally more modular? Um, and so initially, when I started work on this project, we made hematite a lot using a process called spray pyrolysis. Um, which essentially spray coated our uh, fluorine doped and oxide substrates with a hematite precursor. And we got very nice electrodes from that. They didn't have any kind of superior performance though, but they enabled us to, to test the engineering um, um, effects in our systems. And now I'm working with collaborators who are focusing more on chemical vapor deposition. Uh, this is an example of uh, the synthesis of bismuth vanadate on an upscaled electrode. So we're trying to see essentially, can we make big electrodes in the first place? And how big, how big can they actually be? So what are we working with? And a lot of the efforts so far uh, are being conducted on, as you can see, these transparent substrates. Um, why does everybody use these substrates? Well, because they're transparent. So you, it means that you can irradiate the deposited material from the front or from the back, uh, and you have a lot of flexibility um, re re regarding that. And also these materials, the transparent um, conducting oxide, they tend to form adequate junctions with almost any material that you put on top and they don't themselves uh, participate and they don't catalyze the reaction. So it's very useful to use this kind of substrate for the initial experiments, but it does pose some issues when you actually come to, to put it in a reactor. So let's say you've managed to make 10 by 10 centimeter super uniform beautiful electrodes. Does that mean problem solved? Does that mean that you basically design a reactor around those systems? Well, not really. Because as we're starting to find out, um, when you have the benefit of transparency, you have some other problems. And one is that this transparent oxide is actually very resistive. So any current that you feed, so electrons that you feed to the semiconductor or take away, uh, they have to flow through this transparent oxide. And because it's quite resistive, um, it tends to cause losses. Now, when you have small electrodes, these losses are negligible. 
because you have only a small piece of this oxide and because you don't have a lot of current going through it. Um, and the argument was that, well, photoelectrochemical systems, they don't operate at thousands of amps per square meter, uh, like electrolyzers. So you're not gonna have much resistance, even in resistive materials, but that's, that's absolutely not true because um, charge always follows the path of least resistance. So these effects are going to become apparent very quickly. So you've got this issue of resistivity versus optical transparency, right? The more optical transparency you have, the more resistivity you have. Um, and this has been proved um, um, by, by us during a project and also by my colleague, Isaac, who essentially modeled what happens when you use a 10 by 10 piece of fluorine doped tin oxide as the substrate for an electrode. And he showed that if you apply, for example, 1.23 volts either side of the electrode, you still have a really big voltage drop as you go into the depth of the electrode. So what does that mean? It means that all the current will flow through the outer parts of the electrode and not very much through the middle. So what's the point of scaling it up? Well, it's very limited. And the sketch on the left essentially illustrates why electrons don't want to go from where you have your electronic contact all the way to the end of a very resistive electrode. So you will have a much higher current density through closer to the electronic contact than you will somewhere else. So it shows that scaling up such, uh, you know, such electrodes is actually not very sensible. You double the area, you don't double, double the current. Um, there have been some approaches to mitigate these effects. So on top of the FTO, you first put some sort of metallic grid that helps collect and distribute all the electrons to the semiconducting layer. And it's been shown that this really increases the performance of the photoelectrode. Um, uh, but of course, the more you add these conductive strips or whatever, the more light you attenuate. So there's basically a fine balance between um, the soft set and resistivity um, and optical transparency. So what about if we give up on the transparency completely, what happens then? Well, if you take a non-transparent substrate, so for example, let's say you replace fluorine doped and oxide on glass with, um, let's say titanium or something, it means that you can no longer irradiate your semiconductor through the back, and it means that you have to reorientate your electrode such that the light absorbing part faces towards the outside of the reactor so that light hits it directly. Okay, right, so the resistivity of the substrate problem is solved, but you then run into another problem to do with resistivity, but this side, this time on the electrolyte side. So what happens when you go from design 2A to design 2B? Well, design 2A is configured much like a typical electrolyzer. So as in you have your electroactive surfaces, they face each other. And so you have a uniform electric field distribution between them. Why is that important? Because all of the charged species in solution, so the ions, uh, they carry the current in the ionic phase, right? So they have to migrate between the two electrodes. So if this migration path is uniform, you maintain a uniform reaction rate along the length of the electrode, which is what I've shown in this um, graph below. However, if you do not have such an optimum orientation and you reorientate an electrode to face the outside, suddenly the ionic path, which follows the electric field lines, is very much distorted. So the ions have a much smaller path between the uh, edge of the blue electrode um, and the counter electrode than from the middle. So of course the, the middle then becomes deactivated because um, very little charge uh, flows through that and you prefer to have um, high current density at the edges. So and if you were to then do that with two um, photo, let's say you have both of your electrodes are, are photoactive and you reorientate both of them, um, you then have this effect is, is, is exacerbated further. Um, so, by solving the resistivity issue of the substrate, 
you then run into this problem of the, of, <laughs> of the issue in the electrolyte. So what do you do? Um, do you use transparent oxide or uh, do you go for something like this? So it's quite a dilemma. So it's, it, it's like um, trying to finish a jigsaw puzzle and just as you're sort of trying to put the last bit back in, all the others pop out and you can never fully finish it. So it's, it, it's, it's, optimizing one thing and then something else becomes immediately suboptimal so that's the that's the the issue we're having and so to illustrate this in a slightly different way this is just another representation of the effect that i showed here we have two electrodes facing each other lovely uniform current distribution between them we suddenly rotate each of them by 90 degrees so that they both face upwards, which, for example, you have in some of the cell designs where each of them is irradiated from the front, so they're side by side. You can see that most of the current flows through the edges of the electrode and not so much through the rest of them. So if you were to make those electrodes wider, you don't see any increase in performance. The only way to solve that problem is to increase the ionic conductivity of the solution. So, for example, the difference between D and E the sketches is an increase in the electrolyte conductivity by a factor of 10 to the 2. So essentially only when the conductivity of the ionic phase starts to become similar to the conductivity of the electronic phase do these problems go away. But in practice that's not really going to happen. So, so it really is very um, tricky. So what is it that I, where am I in, in all of this research? So if you think about sustainable fuel production and the path to doing that. You first, you know, have chemistry and material sciences development. So developing materials which could actually be used for fuel synthesis. And so you have a lot of material development, testing and characterization, some modeling. And then you move on to scaling up the devices where you also have prototyping, modeling, and subsequently you deal with the questions it and so on. So I sit approximately here. So what I do is I characterize and model the performance of materials that someone else has made. So I'm unlike most photoelectrochemists, I don't, I don't develop, I don't do the hard part of developing and synthesizing my own materials, but I do characterize them, model them, and then use that model for doing scale up um, analysis. And then hopefully that'll provide enough information to do some proper prototyping and um, more industrial scale installations. So this is an example of um, a multi-physics model uh, that we did in ComSol multi-physics, uh, where we had one reactor that wasn't designed to, um, how do you say, we didn't design it because we thought, oh, this is the best design. We designed it specifically to investigate various macroscopic effects and to do some engineering studies. And so we had a photo anode and then just a normal cathode and we um, applied a voltage externally and to see what would happen. And we plugged in our mi microkinetic models for the two materials. So using the Butler-Volmer equation for the platinized titanium cathode, and then um, a modified form of the Gertner-Butler equation, which predicts uh, the flow of photocurrent as a function of potential. Um, and then we divided it, the whole thing with the membrane and we simulated the effect. So here um, in the picture, you can see hematite deposited onto a titanium plate. And then it's got a titanium rod welded to it, which is then taken out of the reactor and um, the electronic contact is made externally. And we compared the performance of hematite on a solid titanium foil with the performance of hematite on a titanium mesh. And the idea is that if you have a mesh, it introduces the ionic shortcuts to homogenize the electric field distribution between the um, suboptimally oriented photoanode and the cathode behind it. And what we showed was that indeed, when you have a suboptimally oriented so solid electrode, despite the fact that you have um, a conductive substrate, so titanium, you still get a non-uniform current density distribution across the electrode surface even in a solution as highly conductive as a molar hydroxide, which is what we used. And with the perforations, this became homogenized greatly. 
Now, this demonstrated the engineering effect, uh, engineering considerations that they are in fact important, although I would stress that this perforation isn't really a suggestion that, oh, all the electrodes should be perforated, it's not really the case because um, often you have several layers of material uh, with more corrosion susceptible materials in there somewhere. And obviously if you do perforations, then everything would just, would just corrode. But it just goes to show that the effects that I'm talking about are genuine. And we were able to reconcile the model results with, with experimental data. Um, so then separately from that, we had a fun project where we designed a reactor differently. So we scaled the electrode only in one dimension rather than in two. And we thought we'd play around with some different optics. So in the image on the left, we have a reactor being um, illuminated using mirrors on both sides. And then in the image on the right, we were just using some conical reflectors and a waveguide. <laughs> so we used these Fresnel lenses to concentrate light onto a spot from which it was then reflected into each side of the, of, of the reactor. You can see it was really, um, mostly just sort of a crude experiment because the Fresnel lenses are being roped together to actually <laughs> to make sure they don't go off focus. Um, but at the same time, it was really nice to get outdoors and actually install this system complete with a flow circuit. So we had pumps, we had reservoirs, we had gas liquid separators, and we had a potential stat for recording the performance. We were able to control the tilt angle of the table. So we, we actually manually adjusted that to sort of crudely track the sun. And this reactor, it, it ended up being nicer than I expected. So on one side, we had uh, hematite, uh, about 15 by four millimeters uh, long hematite made by spray pyrolysis on titanium. Um, the structure, if you look at it sideways, is one of those suboptimal structures that I talked about in the sense that if you were to make the electrodes taller, um, you would start to have um, uh, the non-uniform current density distribution. But in this case, we made the electrode sufficiently um, short. So the, the, you know, long in one dimension, but short in the other dimension. So that this effect wasn't very pronounced and we used COMSOL to, to check that it would be roughly okay. We had uh, an anion permeable membrane and some sodium hydroxide. And then the, the next silly bit was that we used triple junction solar cells as the cathode. So directly integrated into the reactor. We tried to protect it with some titanium dioxide on top so that they didn't dissolve, but they, they it's definitely an example of a material that tends to corrode quite, quite quickly. But at the same time, it allowed us to carry out a few experiments and it was the material we had at hand. And so these are some of the results that we got from it. So we changed the tilt of the table and the position of the table throughout the time of day. So how long was this experiment? One, two, three, four. So about four and a half hours long at the end of August. Um, and the experimentally determined tilt agreed with what was actually expected, you know, from <laughs> astronomical predictions. Um, and we measured uh, the total incident power density using a cosine receptor. Now that part actually turned out to be quite tricky because when you measure the intensity um, in the way that we did, we got contributions from direct and diffuse components of the radiation. Um, whereas what was actually reflected into the reactor was considerably more limited. So definitely if we were to, if we wanted to know exactly the radiation that hit our electrodes, we would need to change the way we did the measurements so that they could exclude uh, some of the radiation that's excluded due to due to shading by mirrors. Um, and then what I've got on this graph in, in yellow, so the yellow dots are a measure of cathodic current density as a function of time. So you see it's a really, really noisy, um, noisy spectrum. But what I want to show is how the, the measured current actually correlated with uh, the weather that we had at the time. So we started off great. We had, you know, with triple junction solar cells, we had 25 amps per square meter um, uh, and everything was great, still great um, after 40 minutes. But then you can see that there's this tiny, tiny, tiny cloud um, approaching our position. And what happened then was, <laughs> despite this very slight cloud, I mean, it was a perfectly blue sky, 
with just this the, this tiny little thing and it had a profound effect on the performance of of, of our device and it just it really reality really hit that <laughs> what would happen if we actually had severe cloud cover it would be quite depressing but then that cloud disappeared and the performance went up again and then we started to get some some a mixture of proper clouds coming in and corrosion so that was the end of the experiment but we were very proud when it actually happened despite the suboptimal suboptimal materials um so I wouldn't publish this result and it remains unpublished despite several years from the experiment because um, the project had to stop and we didn't really have time to finish it off, but the sort of solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency we got was um, sort of between 8% and 4% and the uh, the jumps are due to this inaccurate um, measure of the of the intense solar intensity that actually reached the electrode. But what was definitely very apparent is that if you were to compare the performance of the triple junction solar cells in air um, without any coupling to electrochemical processes and performance in situ, you can see this huge drop. And it's predictable because you have uh, loss in intensity, you have photon absorption by water, reflection of incoming photons by bubbles, you have kinetic losses, i.e. the fact that you need 1.23 volts to drive the reaction. Um, and you have loss of photons due to reflection by mirrors. So the question that I want to answer and going forward is, is there any way of limiting this drop, i.e. will photoelectrochemical devices ever really be um, on, on par with PV plus electrolysis systems? So something I've started working on now with a collaborator in chemistry, uh, Dr. Andreas Kafisis, is we've got a different reactor developed that's a little bit like the reactor that um, Adelio Mendes has in, in, in Portugal. And we're using a three compartment system to, to investigate other effects um, on the performance. So uh, we're going to measure, measure gases, we're going to flow electrolyte, uh, or not flow electrolyte and compare the, the influence of hydrodynamic control on performance. Um, we're simulating optical losses in the system as a result of bubbles, as a result of all the different layers that you have. Um, we're going to do this at first using bismuth vanadate photoanodes and an externally mounted PV. Um, but the idea is to develop that further into a purely photoelectrochemical system, so photoanode and photocathode and no PV. So experiments have literally just started about a month and a half ago and only quite limited. So my ambition is to, to have a huge solar simulator in my new lab um, to characterize these reactors uh, properly because now it's getting to the point that the reactor size is exceeding the limit of the optical <laughs> optical um, solar simulators that we've got. So we need to do something else. And yes, you can take it outside, but then the weather is so variable that it would be hard to really prove that you can reproduce the results. So one final thing I wanted to say is that, yes, I focus on engineering, but I mentioned that I develop microkinetic models to try and help um, uh, with the engineering. And I want to just mention an example of the kind of thing I do. So if you were to take a photoanode material such as hematite or bismuth vanadate, and you were to characterize it using standard electrochemical techniques. So for example, you apply an electrode potential and you measure the photo current. Mm, you get a profile that looks something like the blue line. So what's predicted theoretically is the black line, and this is this Gettner Butler mo um, model that I referred to before. But then you have that 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 model neglects um, fundamental sources of recombination, and so the first one is bulk recombination, and it decreases the current that you measure by a constant factor. So um, this is the recombination of electron hole pairs before the charge actually crosses the interface between the electrode and the solution and then you have surface oops, surface recombination so losses through the transfer of of charge um, um at, at the very interface and 
But the point is, is that all of these effects are relevant to what's called a flat band potential, which is indicated here in the green dot. So the flat band potential theoretically is when the bands in the semiconductor are completely flat, meaning that it's sort of a good reference point for when zero photocurrent should flow in a material. And knowing this potential at which zero current would flow is very important for modeling, right? Because the currents, <laughs> rather, <laughs> you, something is applied relative to something. So it's good to be able to say, at this point, we expect nothing. And then we expect the current to increase. And we describe mathematically how that should happen. And the determination of this flat band potential has proven to be one of the most difficult things I've ever done in my research. In fact, it's taken me six years to figure out why it's such a, an elusive property. And it's, I mean, I find it staggering that you can, you know, you can land a probe on a comet, but still don't know where this flat band potential is on some of the most common materials that are studied. And that's to do with the fact that materials that are being uh, developed at the moment are heavily nanostructured, which means that a lot of the assumptions uh, on which the original interface models were built are actually completely invalid. And a lot of the techniques that are being used now are too, um, too simplified to actually be relevant. So one study I did on just one type of hematite material, um, the, the, the one that took six years, was all in the pursuit of this flat band potential because I just I wanted to know what to put in my model. And I couldn't ever get a reproducible result. And there are four main methods that can be used for determining this flat band potential. And the most, by far the most complicated of the lot is the one that people use the most. Um, so making impedance measurements at the interface between the hematite and the solution and using that to do what's called mott schottky plots, so capacitance, inverse of capacitance squared as a function of potential. And then another method is um, getting a Butler analysis. So you measure photocurrent as a function of potential, square it, and the intercept should give you the, the flat band. But of course, that's only valid if the photocurrent that flows obeys the original prediction. So the prediction doesn't include either of the two recombination modes. So that's out. So if you make a measurement, how can you know whether it's got error in it or not? Another one is chopped photocurrent, which is my favorite one. And also this open circuit potential. The theory being is that if you shine really, really high intensity light on a semiconductor, the bands will unbend automatically. And so if you measure the potential um, at high intensity, that should be your flat band. But as it turns out, that's not necessarily the case. And <laughs> What I wanted to show, just uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the study because it's, it's I could talk about it for hours it, to do it properly, but just to show the extent of the problem. So let's say this is on, on, on this axis here is the electrode potential. So that more or less spans your 1.23 volts required for water splitting. If you look into the literature of the results for synthetic hematite, that have been reported, and this is a lot of publications, this is the spread. So more than 0.8 of a volt spread in what's supposed to be a very precise value used in modeling. So then the study that I did using all four different techniques gave an even bigger spread. Um, so on here, I superimpose the actual potentials for, for water splitting the two half reactions so you can see the staggering <laughs> the staggering problem and then i went through all the different techniques and just to just to report what what, what i observed with each one under different conditions um and so you can see again without going into detail the the enormous spread that actually results so the main conclusion was that the mott has so many errors and you have to take into account so many effects that it's it's not actually the best thing to do. But at the same time, multiple techniques should always be used going forward to character to, to determine this value if the published values are actually going to be sensible and useful to someone else. And you can see the, the huge the huge problem here. So I think having <laughs> Having mentioned that aspect of, of, of my work, um, I think I will conclude. So 
all of this research happened in um, in quite a segmented way. So there were lots of different sub projects interspersed with other projects not related to photoelectrochemistry at all. So it's hard to know exactly which funders to thank, but definitely the EPSRC, same as um, Alex Roberts thanked. Um, so Engineering and Physical Research Council in the UK and also Shell. Um, thanks to whose funding I actually finished this paper on the flat band potential eventually. So they, they funded a project in my department and dense energy carriage, dense energy carriers, just, just, just like for you. But yeah, so just to fin just to round off my talk, um, I very much hope not to not to fall into this technology readiness level valley of death that Alex Roberts talked about. Um, and I was especially scared that it will happen because recently I was at the launch of an EU uh, techno-economic paper and there was a graph showing solar fuels economic roadmap and essentially it said that photoelectrochemically generated solar hydrogen will be able to compete with other methods by about 2095. So. I don't think anyone on the school is going to be alive by then, so I'm quite quite bothered by that. And and yeah, the idea is to try and accelerate things a bit. So thank you very much, and I'll be very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Anna. It was a lovely talk. I guess lots of us learn a lot here today. And um, I will pass the word to Professor Anna. Uh, Flavia, to ask you a question and uh, maybe to conduct the other questions. Go for it, Anna, please. Thank you, Utsong. Uh, Anna, thank you for having you here today again with us. Um, I have so many questions, but <laughs> time is short. Uh, definitely, uh, I think we need to, um, to set a meeting between uh, your group uh, in our division here, Dance and Carriers. We are definitely, we have many, um, in the last three years of our center, we have been developing many uh, materials as not, not only for photocathodes, but photoanodes. Uh, I think it'd be interesting to try to set a collaboration um, with you in order to upscale in some of our best materials. Uh, so my questions, I think is, is gonna be in, the, in this direction. When you talk about your upscaling using hematite, um, so I have two points here that I'd like to ask you. First is the, you mentioned that, okay, you're using a titanium foil. Mm -hmm. The mesh one is, is, the, is the best, um, so that's the best electrode in terms of uh, electric field distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's impossible to, to also to, to test another, um, another method because I think we can use the same electrode that you're using for your own skies um, modules. I think you can mm -hmm. also adapt to um, to your to your system as well. And it was not clear for me uh, from the cathode part. So mm -hmm. you mentioned that you're using a triple junction solar cell. So you have you you in somehow you are biasing the photocathode. I think it was not clear because. Um, so I think that, so these are different sets of experiments. Um, so the one with the perforated hematite on titanium. Um, that was, how do you say, an externally biased system, just to illustrate the effect of the perforations. And then in this experiment, which is the only one I've ever done where we actually had spontaneous hydrogen evolution, as opposed okay. to us applying bias in the lab and seeing the effects, mm -hmm. this one then used the triple junction solar yeah, cell. This one. Yeah, the ah. one with triple junction. Hang on. <laughs> Right, so, so, so this one is not triple junction. This is just um, platinized titanium cathode, hematite on titanium okay. photoanode, externally applied bias. So no spontaneous okay. height, just playing around with potential and then seeing how not much current flows on the plate, but more flows on the mesh because you don't have these resistive effects. And then there was this one Mm -hmm. And here we use the triple junction solar cells, which lasted, well, you, you saw the duration of the experiment, that, that was it. Um, and hematite on the other side. And actually, when I first showed this experiment, someone was like, well, why do you bother with the hematite? I mean, what's that going to do compared to a triple junction solar yeah. cell? Mm -hmm. But because we had a solid area of hematite and just a few of these cells, 
I did a crude kind of when the whole thing was operating, I didn't want to mess with it too much because, you know, bright sun, it's working. Don't touch it. But I did take sort of a sheet of paper and I blocked the light that's hitting the hematite and the current went down visibly. Mm -hmm. um, so the hematite was actually contributing something to this weird hybrid, but fully integrated system. So I'm not, to, I know that James Durant is definitely, um, you know, hematite's not going to be winning, but it's so stable that it's so useful for these experiments, you know. Um, um, so maybe it won't be quite as useless after all, but um, yeah, definitely there were some interesting observations just, but, but it goes to show why there aren't many upscale systems because if the material doesn't last long enough, what's the point of upscaling? Um, <laughs> but it's still, the task for me now is to try and find the most stable materials and check out all of these different engineering effects all the same. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so in, in, in terms of working with different materials in, in the future, that sounds fantastic. Okay, so keep in touch. I think uh, Hudson would like to continue or do you want me to, so, to that say the up to you. I just, I'm just going to read the questions of uh, the people if uh, do you okay, mind? So, yeah, no, go, go ahead. So yeah. uh, thank you, thank, thank you, and I, and I uh, just one more point here. So you are using a uh, hematite, the pristine hematite. You are you are not using any co-catalysts on the, on the top of hematite. And no, 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 no. That, that, that's not to say that the hematite was performing particularly well. So our hematite was never like the superior hematite. It was just good enough hematite for the. To, to prove the points of the experiments that we did. So it was doped with tin four so that it wasn't totally okay. rubbish. But um, I mean, our material development wasn't, you know, to compete with anyone else. It was more sort of spray pyrolysis, quick hematite, put it in the reactor, reproducible, great. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. So what's up? And a, a question from Professor Lucio Mascaro. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, do, you th do you think it's possible to use dye uh, rem uh, remediation instead water oxidation in water uh, in electrolyzers coupled to PV cells um, what, other than in A2 production or CO2 reduction? Uh, I suppose yes. I mean, I've never I've never tried dyes before. I mean, I know that, for example, desensitized cell cells they don't behave very uh, well under concentrated light, and concentrating light is something that I'm particularly interested in. So, using waveguides and um, um, uh, Fresnel lens arrays, uh, coupled to waveguides, to try and concentrate the light that goes into these reactors. So, especially if we're going to use uh, oxide or sulfide semiconductors, you know, they need all the help they can get. <laughs> so you really need to maximize the amount of light. And I don't know how dyes behave under those conditions, um, but I'd be open to trying every, everything, to be honest, if it, if, it, if it looks like it has potential from small scale experiments. So my, my plan is to design reactors for different conditions, right? So for example, in the UK, you've seen the effect of the tiniest cloud. So using Fresnel lenses, given the amount of diffuse radiation is not very sensible, but that doesn't mean that such reactors won't have application. It just won't be in the UK. So you could have concentrators for more, you know, sunnier places where the weather is more consistent and reflectors for somewhere like the UK. So understanding the, the impact of, of how light is fed into the reactor is one of my ambitions. And then to understand what happens with, with heat. Um, because obviously, for example, one of the problems with PVs is PVs like silicon, they don't like to be overheated, right? Their performance goes down. Whereas in integrated systems, the electrolyte that flows past the semiconductor might have a cooling effect. But the question is, if you concentrate light, is that cooling effect going to be negligible or not? So what's the deal? And also, if you keep recirculating electrolyte, it'll gradually warm up as well, given that everything's kind of positioned in the same place. So um, I'm very interested in studying these effects. Um, so the question is, how will the, you know, the dye or any other water contaminant behave under these conditions? So, I mean... 
So limited experience, but I'm <laughs> I'm open to trying new stuff. I mean, in the in the lab that I was in, there was interest in hydrogen sulfide splitting instead of water oxidation, because water oxidation water oxidation requires you know it's the kinetic bottleneck. But if you split hydrogen sulfide, that can come, for example, as waste from um, refining, that really decreases the overall potential requirement to something like 0.4. So, and it was shown to be successful with hematite photoanodes in the lab, but that, there doesn't seem to be much interest industrially, surprisingly, of, of, of doing that. I don't know why. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Uh, there's one more question, uh, or maybe more one or two. Uh, uh, let's say uh, Moisés Albuquerque, uh, he thanks you a lot about the presentation. Uh, he's talking about in the case of a photoelectrodal surface facing directly uh, the illumination, illumination source, uh, he believes is the design to be uh, I was wondering if um, that configuration would hide hide, hide uh, light absorption in the uh, in the situation of evolving a lot of gas from the surface of the semiconductor. Yeah, was that hypothetical situation being considered? If so, how would be the best way to ta to tackle uh, to tackle it? Yep, so, so definitely if so we're talking about either the middle case or the one on the right, such that let's say in this scenario you still have a very decent current density, as a result of which you evolve gaseous products. So if you have a chemically robust electrode, seeing bubbles is normally a very exciting experience because like, yay, gases, <laughs> some respectable rate, but it, qu it, it, it quickly becomes a, um, a problem because if these bubbles don't detach from the electrode surface and they keep growing, they of course scatter the incoming light. Um, so they decrease the amount of light that actually reaches the photo absorber. And the other problem is that they actually, if they stick to the electrode, they obscure part of the active surface area, right? So um, you don't get a reaction if the bubble is sitting on a surface, it's, it's, it's blocking it. Um, so I still believe that the, that, that um, well, so the question for me in the, re in the reactor that we've designed at the moment is to exactly demonstrate these effects. So the way we've designed the reactor means that you can orientate the photoelectrode this way and that way to see the trade-off between the conductivity of the substrate and the issues of the bubbles and so on. But the other way in which bubbles can be removed, in which case they stop being such a problem, is if um, you have flow um, going parallel to the electrodes, like in the systems we've been designing. So a lot of these experiments are done under static conditions in a closed cell, because you know flowing the electrolyte is an extra engineering com complexity. But um, convective effects will have a very big effect on dislodging the bubbles from the surface. And actually, and, uh, this is another way in which nanostructure actually helps. So I've read a few paper, a lot of papers for this review that I'm referencing at the bottom that we published recently, which is that if you have things like nano needles, you have capillary effects taking the bubbles away from the electrode. And it also means that the bubbles, they evolve on the tips of the, for example, nano needles or protrusions, which makes it easier for them to detach. So uh, I don't think that it, in this configuration in the middle that evolving bubbles are necessarily a deal breaker, but it has to be shown experimentally. For example, oh, we're not flowing the solution, lots of bubble coverage won't detach, flowing the solution, suddenly everything's much better. And I think these effects have been demonstrated by um, Katerina Brinkett in some of these experiments that she did in microgravity. So in microgravity, there were no buoyant forces, the bubbles didn't detach as soon as, as, soon as you open the cell to the atmosphere, <sighs> bye. Um, and the electrodes lasted longer and didn't degrade as quickly. So, um, but, but yes, bubbles are definitely a concern. So we have some master's students now doing some modeling in ComSol, actually picking up from the work of um, Daniel Esposito, who 
modeled the effect of individual bubbles on light scattering and things like that. So definitely an interesting problem, but I'm still not completely convinced whether this way or the other way is the best, but. Oh, thank you very much, Anna. I guess you passed through uh, the Maria Rodriguez Pinto question as well. She's talking about the, the many people have uh, many researchers that have, have been calculate the flat potential valves mm. um, and have some issues with that. And so the, the, very, the valves are very different. Well, for example, obtaining an aqua solution while the experiments are in the gas phase setup. Can you comment about the arrows effect that might exist in the type of uh, analysis? So you, you talk about the bubbles. Is there anyone else that you want to point out? So, okay, so th was the flat band potential point and the bubble point part of the same question or were those separate comments? All right, I, let me just open the, the, the chat. So oh, yeah, yeah, please, please go for it. Um, is it in the Q and A section? Uh, I guess it's at, at YouTube. Yeah, the the the, the way uh, I'm going to read what she wrote, so maybe it's easier. Well, many papers present measured and calculate flat potential valve obtained in a condition quite different from the experiment conditions. For example, obtaining in aqua solution while the experiments are in gas phase setup. Can you comment about the arrows effects that might exist in this type of analysis? Is that clear or? Not quite, but uh, um, I am thinking that... Um... Anna, I put this question in chat. Can you see? Oh, yes. Many... I mean, so so regarding the gas phase setup, I, I I'm I'm not familiar with uh, either papers or or experiments about that. So my experience has been exclusively with uh, a semiconductor liquid uh, interface. So um, I'm not sure about the gas. I just know that I have colleagues who develop photocatalysts for reducing gaseous CO two um, on sort of particulate suspension, so no aqueous phase at all. And they are always being made to, you know, the reviewers say you need to specify the flat band potential. And so they end up putting their material in, in aqueous solution, where of course the, the values are completely irrelevant for the gas phase, because the flat band potential is a property of the interface. So the Fermi level and the semiconductor can have exactly the same energy. So you have the same material, you put it into different solutions, the flat band potential will be different for all of them. Um, and I mean, th there are multiple reasons for that, but it's definitely an interfacial property. So there's no point in measuring flat band potential in liquid and applying it to the gaseous phase. Um, yeah, but uh, for, for my experiments in the liquid phase, one of the things that is always emitted is the presence of the potential drop in the Helmholtz layer. So there's always an assumption that if you apply a potential across a semiconductor liquid interface, it's always dropped across the semiconductor, right? So you plot your potential on the x-axis and you assume that all your changes in potential are exactly, uh, exactly that and nothing goes across the Helmholtz layer. But of course, that's that's actually completely incorrect because a lot of these nano structured materials, they tend to be quasi metallic, they're very heavily doped. And when you have a metal solution interface, the entire potential drop is dropped across the Helmholtz layer. That's how electrochemistry on metals works. And I used modeling in one of the papers that that I wrote to show Oh, when you have, for example, hematite, it's very heavily doped, and you can show that a lot of the potential drop is dropped across the, the Helmholtz layer. So it means that this entire axis on which you're plotting your data is completely stretched or shrunk or whatever relative to reality. And so you get completely the wrong gradients, intercepts, everything. Um, and without doing some approximate modeling, you cannot really disentangle those effects. So I think that's kind of. I would say that's my best, the best answer I can come up with right <laughs> now. I have to continue this conversation sort of offline. Yeah. 
you have done very well. Thank you very much once again. Again, and uh, one last question, just to, to finish, and uh, I guess we we pass the time. But uh, uh, Juliano ask uh, Juliano Bonacin ask it. In your opinion, your opinion, what uh, what is the most important challenge in the scale up of photoelectrochemical cells? Thank you very much. Is there any most important challenge if it's, if it's not? Or if it's, is there one that you can point out? Well, it, 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 it probably will be, will be exactly what I have on this, on this slide that I've got up at the moment. Um, it's, it's, it's a fight with macroscopic effects. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's trying to optimize for multiple things at the same time. And you're, you're always faced with, with deciding what is your, you know, what, what parameter are you going to fix uh, with which you then have to work. So, for example, if I'm going to use a waveguide, you know, it's going to be long and shallow that fixes the size of my electrode. I then pr proceed to look at the problems that you get with a system like that. If you have to have an, you know, an inclined reactor with a massive surface, that's a completely different set of challenges. So, well, not completely different, but it's a different emphasis on the challenges. So, I mean, but all the time you're going to have this problem with the distribution of current density because you have the, that and other electrochemical systems as well. But I mean, I <laughs> I can't pinpoint it down to just the one. There's just so many. That's the problem. That's why it's such an uh, as my former as my PhD supervisor would call it an over constrained problem. It's just like it's constrained to the point that you just can't move um, anywhere. But yeah, so it's deciding what substrate to put your electrodes on and how to orientate them relative to each other, which is I guess the part where, point where people say just use particulate systems. <laughs> <laughs> and then you solve that problem. But for me, that's a, that's a very difficult dilemma. So how to optimize for both um, substrate resistivity and this um, problem with the orientation, yeah. We would like to thank you once again to find time and to share all this knowledge, to be so um, uh, um, uh, precise and uh, try to make this very complex uh, subject, uh, this field topic to us in a very simple way. You're so didactic and thank you very much to, to all of this and for all the patience and um, uh, yeah, I, I oh, guess the guys will be you. in touch. Thank you so much. I'm very honored and delighted to present and thank you to everyone for sticking, sticking with it despite the fact that I forgot to put up my slides <laughs> as well. <laughs> no. I and I thank audience at that point. <laughs> Anna, thanks a lot for a nice talk. Thank it's you. very, Thank very you interesting. I, I have interest to scale up my photo nodes and photo cathodes. I produce my photo nodes and photo cathodes using electron deposition, electron mm -hmm. deposition process. It's possible to produce uh, thin films uh, in um, different substrates and different uh, size it's a good a good um, uh, technique it's a very uh, it's an expensive and they produce different um, oxides different semiconductors I write for you for, <laughs> to uh, to uh, invite the to possible collaboration between us okay thank you so much thank you so very much <laughs> bye bye thank you that's our bye. pleasure bye. To everybody. thank you very much see you guys in the afternoon most of us already have received the link for the for the next section so see you guys bye 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 bye, bye.